Welcome to Magical Aspirations, a podcast for magical people, where we aspire to gather all of the knowledge that magic has to offer. A place to illuminate and demystify all things magical. We are your magical co-hosts. I am Annalisa. Revan Raven here. Adriana. Tune in every Tuesday where we're dropping new episodes every week about our own personal magical stories. Have a spanking good time. And sprinkle some interviews in between. There is so much magic here. Keep coming back every week. Stay magical. Stay magical. Stay magical. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, listeners, wherever you are. This is Magical Aspirations. Welcome to our episode this week. Of course, you know I've got my two lovely co-hosts with me. Ladies, go ahead and say hello. We've got Miss Adriana here today. Hello. And then the lovely Reverend Raven, as always. Hello. Hello. And you know me, I'm Annalisa. This week, we are going to be talking about color magic. As I was getting ready for this episode, I kind of realized that this is probably the easiest and most efficient magic that I find myself practicing. I do it every single day and it is totally on autopilot now. I'm really curious to know, Rev, how do you use color magic in your day-to-day practices? Um, basically what I do is I just take a look at the world around me and see how those colors make me feel. Um, so if I'm thinking about a problem and say I'm walking down the street and all of a sudden I see an, a beautiful orange flower, it reminds me to be confident and sure in what I'm doing. Um, if I'm wobbling on a decision, it helps me to know that I have the answer already and to be confident in my decision and my idea. Um, so basically, I rely on my intuition to see how those colors make me feel. I love that. What about you, Adri? Uh, color magic is everywhere for me as well. Um, I think for me personally, I've been tapping into it a lot more lately digitally. So like on my screens um, and yeah, doing like protection and then also kind of uh, inspirational color magic too. But then also for me, color magic is a about helps me connect deeper to nature as well because I think about Mm -hmm. the birds as always (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. and thinking about the color of their feathers and how that helps them to live the life that they live based on whether they're prey or birds of prey or whether they are neighborhood birds or they like take big migrations or whatever the case may be um and that teaches me quite a lot about the beauty of what colors can be and to not just focus on like what google says a color means Mm. if that makes sense Mm-hmm. It absolutely does. That's something I've been talking about with some of my magical friends lately about how, you know, what does this sign mean? What does that sign mean? I have been doing so much less searching for the answer and letting the mm-hmm. answer really come to me. Um, and I really agree with you guys. Color magic is like, it's just this inherent thing that I, you just gravitate to, you know, same thing like Adriana was saying, it's such a connection to nature. Um, we've been talking about how spring has been not even really creeping, but kind of like slamming its way, da- especially down here in the South right now. I live in Louisiana and I woke up this morning and everything is fucking green. And I'm like, thank yes. God. I really, really struggle in the winter months and like the green is here. Oh, mm-hmm. I can breathe again. Thank God. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. It was like, here in Tennessee, um, we have the Bradford pears. And for those that don't know, they're the fucking fish trees. When they start blossoming, they smell like fish. Okay. Anyway, got that out of the way. So <laughs> nothing. I mean, like for the past weeks, nothing. And then it was just like all of a sudden this weekend, boom, all the Bradford pears are blooming. And I'm like, God, thank you, nature. But also like y'all could have kept those. <laughs> <laughs> (laughs) 
That's funny. We were talking before we started recording about um, the signs of spring up here. Um, this is my first winter back in Indiana after several years, and I have really been relishing in those little signs. And um, the first few things that we see that are signs of spring are the robins, um, mm -hmm. which have uh, the bright red breasts and um, the daffodils. I've seen a few mm -hmm. of those daffodil mm -hmm. flowers and tulips. Um, we don't have the flowers yet, um, but you can see the shoots in all along the side of the house. There are tulip plants popping up. So I'm excited to see um, what it's going to look like outside of my new home here soon. Mm -hmm. Yay! Yay! Yeah. That is so exciting. That is so exciting. The same, my passion vine. We had a really, really dry year last year. Um, and I really thought that my poor little passion vine had put it um but she's got three new big sprigs and like i feel like they're growing like yeah. four inches every uh -huh. day um oh my goodness i could talk about the joys of spring we could probably make a whole episode about that <laughs> um but i'm really fascinated to dive a little bit deeper into color magic how we utilize it i kind of want to break it down by color and see how we feel how our magic is similar how our magic is different but I want to get an elephant out of the room about color magic because a lot of people have a lot of different magical practices, especially really eclectic practitioners. We tend to draw on sources outside of ourselves, you know, take a mishmash of things from other cultures and things like that. Um, I want to talk about the chakra system really briefly because it's so ingrained in color magic, I find. Um, it was a huge part of how I learned to really connect with the different energy points in the body but we also don't want to be um cultural culturally appropriating anybody's culture because that's we all know that's not a good jive anybody wants to get on um how do you guys feel about that is that something that y'all ever have y'all connected with that with y'all magic have y'all learned different ways to associate color magic i just kind of wanted to bring it up because it's so common core now in the magical community hmm. Yeah, I definitely have learned about colors through the chakra system, but also have learned about colors in other ways, too. So it's not forefront for me as much. And then now colors have such a deeper meaning for me where I am today that I can kind of separate the two. And that feels good and I think it's helpful for probably people who are beginning because it is such a prevalent system that is a lot more accessible to learn about as opposed to maybe learning about something from a culture your own ancestral background that maybe isn't as heavily documented or easily to find um so but again you do have to go to the source so it's a it's a, mm -hmm. it's a lot to say there yeah mm -hmm. yeah i i would say i'll use an example um about the chakra system and colors um something that was a little confusing for me um was green being associated with the heart chakra um, because in my mind, like heart and love energy, like that had always been like pre-programmed as like pinks uh, and reds mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and especially even in like you look up, you know, color associations and things like that from magical texts that are mostly, I would say, Celtic based. Um, you you learn that, you know, that pinks and reds are associated with love, for example. And as the heart being your center of, you know, where you exude love and things like that, those two things didn't really mesh. Um, for me, greens are associated <laughs> with, you know, the beginning of life and growth and things like that. But I have sitting on my desk here, a malachite. And for some reason, malachites that are all different kinds of greens, they are associated very heavy with water energy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, my point is that it's not just well, let's say it's not just black and white. <laughs> it's not <laughs> this color means this. It really is how you feel in the moment and accessing your intuition because you are the magical tool. It matters how it makes you feel. 
not what some book says about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well said, both of you. Thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm. I, what's your favorite colors? What colors do y'all gravitate towards? <laughs> um, <laughs> I <rest>. am <laughs> sometimes, uh, but no, I have been a fan of purple for mm -hmm. since my teenage, early teenage years. Um, and more, it's a light purple, very lavender color. Um, it is not a dark purple. I have to be very specific. Um, but then other colors like greens are really nice to me. Reds are really good. And I do, I do love black. Black is such mm. a, ugh, it's just mm. juicy. Love it, it so is. much. Um, and lately browns have been sticking out to me and I'm very impressed oh. because I used to be very against brown. Um, but I guess that's what you call maturity. So oh, <laughs> yes. I am glad you brought that up because that was my next question. Whenever there's a, you know, we go from one extreme, we want to go to the other. What's your least favorite color? I'm going to be honest. It's probably pink. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Riff? Um, of course I have a, a spectrum, a list, um, <laughs> but it has changed over time as well, as far as my preferences and, um, things that maybe I hated, I don't hate quite so much. Um, so I love dark purple, um, I guess because of the regality of it, it's very deep and, um, rich. So I really love dark purple and orange. Orange has been one of my favorite colors for most of my life. That really bright, vibrant orange. Um, I like whenever oranges are mixed with reds and yellows. Um, but I used to really not like yellow very much. And I hated pink as a little girl. Um, and I think that that is social programming, though, because mm -hmm. I... Um, was told that I should like pink and should wear pink. And I always detested that. And my, then my mom was respectful of, you know, my wishes and things like that. So uh, where I'm from, you get a new Christmas dress and you, we would wear that when we would go to the Nutcracker or um, to whatever thing that we were doing for Christmas time. And um, I specifically remember one certain dress, it was black with a little pink bow on it because it's hard to find a dress yeah. for a little girl that doesn't have pink on it so and true. I I am so excited to see that shift um in our culture that now whenever you're buying clothes for children that you can find them in different colors um for boys and girls that um you know that there are a lot of different color options for clothing for children and so then hopefully they get to pick what colors they like and um for us as you know people in our culture at least um how you're dressed and how you present yourself is very much associated with your identity um, so like, I never really wanted to be that girly girl and that's why I hated pink, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, um, it was the association culturally with the color. Um, and now that I'm a grown ass adult, I can have, I have a pink phone charger and I have a, a few pink things in my wardrobe, but it's, it's not very heavy, but I'm learning to be okay with it because I know that it isn't a direct reflection of who I am, mm -hmm. um, that I, I can utilize colors, um, and especially like in my clothes and like glamour magic, um, to, um, convey different things that I can use oh. those colors to morph how I look and how I'm portraying myself based on what I'm trying to do. That is such an important point. I'm so glad that you said that because so my favorite colors, I'll start there. My favorite color tends to be in like the, the bluish greenish teal kind mm. of range. Um, and my least favorite colors have always been like orange and yellow. Um, even now I really struggle with orange and yellow, like highlighter yellow is okay. And like maybe like I have this one nail file that's sitting in front of me that is yellow and orange and I will not like I don't even like touch it. I just don't <laughs> like it. I don't care for it. But so you were talking about Rev about how 
you know, pink is so traditionally, you know, it's pink and blue for, for, I saw there's this store near where I live and I, the name of it, it's called <laughs> pink and blue. Uh, and <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. I saw the name and I'm sorry for if you, whoever owns that store, if you're happening to be listening, I'm sure you have a beautiful store, but I do think the name is a little stupid because like it does this so like, ugh. But my point is that so I have always gravitated towards darker colors, like deeper, richer, mm-hmm. jewel tone colors, even now into being an adult. But I think that that came from that being someone who's always been a little on the bigger side, especially in a relatively small family. Dark colors mm-hmm. help you hide things. The bright colors, you see the shadows a lot more. So you see, you know, you put yourself out there for people to see when like you're when you're a bigger person, you're supposed to be like in the background and kind of try to blend in and things like that. And not shitting on the jewel tones, because like I said, those are still my very favorite colors. Like your emerald green, your dark regal purple, your royal blue. Like I, that is my jam. But I find as I get more into my adulthoods, I'm in my my mid thirties now. I love iridescent colored things and holographic Mm -hmm. colored things. And like my main water cup that I use is yellow and orange and blue and pink. And it's got a bunch of colorful stickers on it. Um, because I've really become not afraid to be, to be seen, to put myself out there. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think that color magic really plays into that also of the Becky, like you said, kind of about the glamour magic or even about when we, we don't want to be seen magic, you know, we're more willing to put ourselves out there. Magic color magic has so many different layers to it that I just find so, I find that so fascinating. And I do find it interesting that all of us kind of have a mild detestation for pink. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And you know, what's, what's interesting for me with pink, it's not like, as far as it being on my person, no, I have maybe like two things that are pink in my closet. Um, But when it comes to like working with the color pink and especially with self-love work I Mm -hmm. eat that shit up I want it all over my candles or in my herbs or like the jars I use whatever the case may be so I will have my magic and then I also feel like I use it a lot when I'm doing kind of like meditation and like energy work either on myself or with others I do ask the color pink to show up and, you know, like help me, whatever the case may be. But yeah, when it like wearing it or having it on the walls and decorations, absolutely do not. Um, So I think it's, it's, it feels good to have like that respect and that it's not a total turn off because sometimes I feel like at any point, a color, just like with all things, can be helpful to you. You just kind of have to test it out and, fe- and feel your way through what that place is. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally yeah definitely. Totally. I asked um, my resident Pisces what his thoughts were about color magic before we came <laughs> on here. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> and, of course, it started out with, Well, because colors are basically how we perceive them, um, colors are not real in the environment. They are how we perceive the colors on different things, you know, based on your eyesight and how much light you have and things like that, for example. Um, It's really based on how you feel about it. So don't get hung up on looking up you know, definitions of associations mm-hmm. and things like that, really relying on your intuition um, for how it makes you feel and how it makes you feel in that present moment. So don't get hung up on, you know, well, normally green means this, but in this case, you know, I feel a little bit different about it. You need to be able to change your beliefs and go ahead and let that, you know, kind of go to the side with your classic um, associations, even if it's just how you normally think about it, like being willing to shift your own um, thought pattern and how you feel about a color, that that's really important. Leave it to the Pisces. My right. God. Oh my Love God. Is, okay. <laughs> so it's over. Mic the- drop. <laughs> That's a typical t- a typical sounding of Pisces response is that we have to just go with the flow of how we feel about it. But I loved that he used the explanation about how we perceive colors in our eyesight. And um, 
it's interesting because he has difficulty differentiating between dark colors, like dark blues and greens mm. and blacks. Interesting. Um, so that made me think about, well, what about people who do have a, a differing degrees of colorblindness? Mm-hmm. They I don't thinking about see the colors. On yet. Same. Yeah, the yeah. same way that someone who can see the full color spectrum does. But also, recent research has shown, you know, we talk about dogs can only see black and white. Well, recent mm-hmm. research has shown based on their eyes that the cones and rods that they have in their eyes, they actually can perceive colors that are yellows and blues. Mm-hmm. 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 So that's interesting to me to think about like how we perceive colors that can be very based on what colors mean to us, but why would dogs need to see blue and yellow? Like there has to be a reason that they can see blues and yellows to survive. And that that, that has to be the same across different species, but we just don't know how they perceive the world around them. Because we Mm -hmm. haven't taken the time to do the research. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As Mm -hmm. you were talking about your lovely Pisces response. So I recently, a week or two ago, um, I got a betta fish. uh, And observing him has just been one of like the newest things. Like it's just so fascinating to watch. Uh, He's got this real big tank and he's like this. You think betta fish and I guess you kind of, at least for me, my perception was that they're this like spooky, lazy kind of, you know, they want to hide all the time. This dude, like, I had to look up, like, is he stressed? Is something wrong? Because he, he's he got this big 10-gallon tank. He's, like, zipping around the thing. Like, he's active. He's doing all this kind of stuff. And so I was really trying to make sure that I was seeing things from his perspective to make mm-hmm. sure he's been comfortable in his new home. Um, and one of the things that I learned, I'm sure this is true for most fish, but the beta, the beta fish specifically, they can see two different angles like so from each of their eyes they perceive two different things because you know obviously their eyes are Mm. on opposite sides of their head um and like that was making me think about how they perceive color and things like that and like you know adriana when you were talking about the birds earlier about being birds of prey all of these things it's as becky you were just talking about the dogs how they perceive you know blues and yellows it also makes you wonder why don't they see things like reds and Mm -hmm. like what is and there aren't a lot of like when you think about like dog breeds right they tend to be black and brown and white and like you know kind of a mish there is no red like we call them red but there's no truly like red colored dog i wonder what that has to do with like canine evolution and that's just it's a fascinating you know whenever we talk about magic we talk about the balance of it and so yes Mm -hmm. they can see blues and yellows but why can't they see reds and i Mm -hmm. i I wonder Mm -hmm. if it's the same for like people on like their spiritual evolution or like something like that like as you grow and heal do the way you see colors change Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can definitely see that the way that we perceive them change Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like the way we think about different colors like what i said i realized that the reason that i detest pink is not because there's something inherently wrong with the color it's because of Mm -hmm. the cultural associations that i had with the color Because Mm -hmm. people told me that pink is for girls. And when you're a girl, all those things that come along with it, uh, being timid and you're, um, you know, not well spoken and you just do what you're told and things like that. Well, that is not me. (laughs) So I'm not. (laughs) But like I said, there's it's not that there's something inherently wrong with a color. It's just the way that we think about it. Your perception of it. Yeah, Yeah, I agree. I and that I like think, white, for example, is all the colors. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. whenever I like when I'm using color magic and I don't have the color that I think that I should be using, I will go to that white candle, for example, because white contains all the colors. Mm-hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think at least for me, thinking about my own spiritual journey and how sometimes in ritual and like doing work, I would be very, I'd wear my black because it felt super protective for me. And Mm -hmm. it was also a comfort for me. And so 
as I got deeper and closer to my ancestors and learned more about their practices and practicing those practices, um, it's very much like you must wear white when you are, mm. you know, doing the sacred, especially something that is as deep as ancestral work and certain rituals involving nature, you must wear white. Um, and that was such a new experience for me. I was, I felt very uncomfortable the first few times mm -hmm. that I was on in my all white. Um, and I felt, I felt like I was doing something wrong. I, mm. and that was something I had to work through because I, the more I thought about it, the more it was just like, it's just because I'm not used to it. And I already had my comfort and I had to re, I guess, reassociate and re familiarize myself with white and what it comes with and what it means for me. And so now when I wear my weight, like that, that's fine. It's just normal. Um, but sometimes when you're doing this color magic, because it, it, it is based on your perception um, and your teachings and your own like spiritual DNA. And so there's going to be things that you have to work through and it's not all going to be like, ah, oh, so fluffy, lovely, love that. <laughs> yeah. um, and sometimes when you're working with new colors, it will, it will feel awkward. It will feel awkward. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I I would definitely agree with that because I used to always wear um, like black and red together. And those for me were like my powerful colors whenever I was doing magic or going out, uh, for example, to like Rocky Horror Picture Show and things like that. <laughs> I would always wear black and red together. And I felt um, a few years ago, the shift uh, from red to purple. And so mm. a lot of my spiritually were black and purple because it meant mm -hmm. something different to me like with my perception and how how I was showing up in the world that the purple yeah. meant something different for me and how I was portraying myself and my energy and my power mm. well, yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> Was that the okay. little round one? No, that was hollow this time. No, that was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Do you, that makes me giggle. We were talking about this at work the other day, the, the orange cat theory. Um, anybody mm -hmm. who's ever experienced an orange cat, you know that they are a force unto themselves. Uh, and it, it makes me laugh. Uh, one of the, the client that I was talking to about it, she's this real kind of scientific lady. So she was like, what is the, I need to know the science behind the orange cat theory. And I was like, I, I'm sure there's maybe a study somewhere, but I've never read it. All I have is my observations from 15 years being a vet tech and obviously social media, because who doesn't love cat videos all the time. Um, <laughs> but orange cats are just, they're just themselves. They're just, they're goofy. They're silly. There's the joke about the one brain cell that they try to find all the time. And it is, I, I take so much from their guidance about like just being, being you. And that is what orange is a color. I think that's why I struggle with it so much because it is just, orange is there orange is what it is and it's just not my favorite and i think that's a testament to my own struggles that i have um mm. i just i was hollow barking and looking at my dog yeah. thinking about the goofiness of these colorful animals <laughs> okay so i was thinking a few things about that about the orange i think that that is why i have always gravitated towards orange because i've always known that i was different and I associate with the color orange so much because it is just bold and out there. It doesn't blend well with other colors. It's not like the other colors in the way that it's perceived. Um, it's not normally like a soothing kind of color. It's usually like a high vibrancy, like stand out be bold kind of color and I think that's why I have always associated with it um second thought about that uh my first pet was an orange tabby named tiger <laughs> that I got whenever I was three years old and so I learned to 
see the world through the eyes of an orange tabby um, who just was himself. Um, we couldn't keep him inside. Um, he, one of his, his big adventures, he definitely had nine lives. Um, but one of his big adventures, he got out of the house cause we could not keep him in no matter how hard we tried. Um, he got out and, um, got stuck up in a car motor and that happens a lot up here where it's cold, especially mm-hmm. in the winter that they'll try to get warm and be up in the hood of the car. And most of the time, if that happens, the cat doesn't make it. Well, my cat was in the hood of a car. Somebody started the car. He took off. My dad found him and he had the skin was off the top of his head down to the bone. Uh, the skull was exposed. Part of his tail was missing. He was missing a toe. And my stepdad uh, strapped him to the back of his motorcycle and took him to his work. Um, he was a doctor. And so he sewed up my cat after his big adventure. And um, the point of that story is that Tiger was always being himself. And for the most part, the universe just looked out for him being himself. Um, he was allowed to just be him, you know, and um, no matter kind of what he did, however crazy he was, um, he was okay. And he ended up living to be 21 years old. Wow. 21 wow. years old being an indoor outdoor cat because we could not keep him inside. Uh, but, uh, he was wild. Wow. That is almost unheard of to have an outside yeah. cat be quite, especially yeah. if you go, you use in so many of your lives. But yeah, yes. that is a testament to exactly, exactly that about orange being. I also find it fascinating that orange is a color in nature that other than, well, the flowers too, that, you know, when you think about like toxic things or like, I always think about like the crazy, like the poisonous frogs that like, they're all these like yeah. crazy bright wild colors mm-hmm. um, because I'm now a beta fish expert. I've taken like three pages of notes about the beta fish. Um, <laughs> they're all of these wild colors kind of for the same reasons that like, you know, they're get out of my space and do, you know, I'm yeah. over here doing me. Um, I will tell you guys as much as I don't like orange though, that sucker in the middle of his cage, he's got this big orange, like willow tree looking thing that just like flows about in the, in, in the, in the, the surf the current um so i was proud of myself for that because i really do hate orange <laughs> <laughs> okay so now we have the shift to talk about brown dogs if we're gonna talk about yes. animals and colors um <laughs> annalisa and i have this joke about brown dogs and that they're always oh just doing silly things and getting into trouble and basically their behavior is based on the amount of brown that they have in their coat Mm -hmm. and um so my dog zelda as she has gotten older she's lost all of her brown because she is aged um but we joke that as she has lost her brownness um she has lost that part of her attitude and her behavior Mm -hmm. (laughs) has improved i would oh my god that i can agree to that yes yes (laughs) But the brown dogs typically are crazy to some degree and somewhat bad. (laughs) And they just are kind of kind of be themselves. And we have to love and accept them for who they are as brown dogs. That is 100 (laughs) percent the truth, because I, too, have a brown dog, Brody Murphy Majura. Uh, Ladies, I'm going to text you guys a picture that I took of this creature the other night. So I was just like on my bedroom floor stretching before bed. And then I look up and this. This shit brown dog is like judging me from he's up on my bed and I'm on the floor and he's just like got this look on his face that y'all will really appreciate. Um, But yeah, I've sang him the shit brown dog song for his whole life and it just goes shit brown dog and like he (laughs) wags his little tail at me and like that is the the shit brown dog shenanigans. It's the truth. They are the orange cats of the canine world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. He's definitely looking at you like, why are you on the floor, you silly peasant? Yeah, yes. seriously. <laughs> because, okay, so a little Brody backstory, right? My <laughs> husband, we giggle about this all the time. So Brody reminds me of, like, a lady from the, like, 
late 1800s, early 1900s were like very prim, were very proper. There's like, I always have my hat on, my gloves are on. Um, and Brody does not like to cuddle by the light of day. Like if you go sit next to him on the couch when the sun is out, he will absolutely get up and move. He will go move to the other side of the room. He does not want, he does not want to be touched. We do not do that when people, when the doors are open, mother, like, my God, how could you even suggest <laughs> But when the sun goes down and it's time for bed or we, and we are in the confines of our own space, then we may have consensual touching. And so this was me. I was late for that. I was too busy stretching and trying to keep my 35-year-old body mobile. And he was like, uh, ma'am, you're cutting into our cuddle time. Um. <laughs> like you only get so much of it. Please act accordingly. Yes. Correct. Right. And can't you see that on his dumb little face? Like, God, yeah. I love this foolish creature. But yeah, shit brown dog. That is truthfully, that is a thing. That is a thing. Oh, man. I can't wait to put a brown dog now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Y- you have been forewarned. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi. Okay. So let's, what are some of the colors we haven't talked about yet? We've obviously mentioned black. We've mentioned white. Um, Let's talk about red. What is red? I know Rev, you kind of touched on that. You've gravitated away from red a little bit. Um, What does red make you guys feel? What do you, what magic do y'all use red for? Mm, I use red for quite a lot. Um, I, well, I believe I'm trying to think maybe it was a couple years ago. Um, I actually shifted my protection colors to red. Um, mm. I don't know if I shifted it or whatever, whatever the case. <laughs> <may be. laughs> the protective colors were shifted to red, um, in a couple of other colors. Um, and that was a really big shift because I again was just heavy on the black as my protection color. Um, But now, yes, I think of red in that way. I also see Mm -hmm. red as being this kind of uh, uh, to revitalize something, Mm -hmm. to bring back creativity, to bring back inspiration. I see it as a spark. Um, And I also see red as, of course, being super connected to vitality um but only because it is connected to the our blood but blood is only red when it is oxygenated Mm -hmm. Um, and so that to me makes me think that because it is connected to blood but there was this outside force that it reminds me of community as well and how things come together to be revitalized to be um awakened to be inspired or made whole again so that's where red shows up for me ooh okay i like, do have a question for you so since your muggle job is in uh recruiting and new hiring and things i read a study the last job that i applied for um I was really gung ho about trying to get it. So I was like, you know, tips and tricks and things like Mm -hmm. that. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I saw was to wear red during your interviews. Mm -hmm. And I, I wore red in my interview. I felt really confident. It obviously made a difference. Uh, Do you find color magic seeping into some of your work in that way? Oh, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. Thanks for asking. Um, (laughs) When I was, after I graduated college, my first big girl job, I wore red to my interview and I got the job. Um, And then I tend to also encourage other people to wear colors that make them feel powerful when they are doing interviews. Because if you feel good in what you're wearing, it's going to seep into how you present yourself in those interviews, even though we all know interviews are fucking terrifying. Um, And I think that should be especially true for marginalized people, whether you're a woman, whether you're a person of color and you're disabled, whatever case may be you should really lean into that magic about how you are presenting yourself um even if it goes against what is typical and i'm saying that with hard air quotes around um and i think especially when i'm trying to like say like hey you should come work if i'm like writing a newsletter for example i'm gonna use colors that are not super vibrant but 
they Mm -hmm. are a little bit more calming. So especially with my Ink to Prosperity work, I do use more like muted tones um, Mm -hmm. because that's the vibe I I like to bring with I2P. But in my Mm -hmm. muggle work, my recruiting work, I will use a little bit more Um, like instead of a muted red it might be a little bit more fire truck red um but it's not going to be like a neon fucking green that's not (laughs) the vibe i'm trying to give off um and even when you're thinking about like what uh i had a client do this the other day um they were trying to figure out like what industry they want to be in and so we started talking about the colors of industries and how when you think about healthcare it's blue Mm -hmm. Um, and then when you think about tech, especially right now, it's a lot of like greens and neons and there's black and there's gray. Um, and then when you think about teaching, there's a lot of yellows, there's some blue in there as well. Um, but there's a lot more yellow in teaching and, you know, we could go on, but they were able to think about the industry and like the colors associated with those industries to really narrow down where it is that they wanted to put their um, energy and what they wanted to kind of like work in based on those colors. So yes, there's so much more I could say, but I'll. <laughs> no, I love, I love that. That's because I think that's, you know, kind of like I touched on in the very beginning about that. This is such an inherent magic that people are using it. And I don't think they even, it's just so typical, you know, it's like you said, air quotes around typical uh, <laughs> that it is, but it's the truth. And, and I'm, I'm just so fascinated of how, like Becky, we were talking earlier about uh, what Adam said about the, the perception of, of the color. And I love that we've gotten to a space where color the meaning of it can change because I really agree with you, Adriana. Uh, when I do a lot of in a lot of Italian cultural practices, black is such a big, heavy color. Uh, but for ancestral connection, that's really been it's been red. It's been a lot of red. I find myself putting um, red things on my ancestral altar. Um, so that's a fascinating correlation. What about you, Rev? How do you feel about red? Um, I really like the correlation with blood. Um, I was trying to figure out how it made me feel about it. Um, because all, at least, uh, mammals have blood and it's our life force. Um, that's how, how I feel about it. Um, but I do tend to use it for protection as well. And I feel like whenever I was a younger practitioner, I found myself feeling the need to protect myself a lot more uh, than I do now. So I think that that might be why I was leaning more towards the black and red, uh, together, um, where now, uh, I, it's a different form of protection, but I use more boundaries as opposed to like warding. Like, I think that somebody's going to come and hurt me. Well, if you just set up good boundaries, the chance of someone coming to hurt you is a lot less. So I think that that's why I tend to use, like I said, more purples and things like that, as opposed to the red for that specific practice, um, because I'm not feeling threatened like I was as a younger practitioner. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh, perfect. 100. Perfect, Um, perfect sense. mm Mm-hmm. And I do associate red again with vitality, um, with love for community. That's a, mm-hmm. a thing that I, a uh, conclusion that I draw as well. Um, I, earlier when you asked about our favorite colors and I said there was a list, um, I love the rainbow. I love to use yeah. the colors. I love to use the colors together. And ever since I was young, I loved to have things that were rainbow colored. And then as I um, got older, it was around whenever I was in high school that I learned about gay pride and the use of the rainbow as a symbol of that. Um, but I have always loved the rainbow together. And using all of the different colors in the spectrum together. Um, And now that I am at a school working um, in a conservative area and very muggle type job, I have a bracelet um, that is a rainbow that I wear every day. And I get compliments from the students about it. Um, But to me, the rainbow, again, is that 
association with being who you are, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter who you are, no matter which color that you are, you can be who you are. Like no matter how you're identifying that day, you know, that you can be that, you can be that color and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's making me think more that I, more that I am working with people who are on the autism spectrum. The word mm-hmm. spectrum is a color spectrum as well. Mm-hmm. And so I, when I see the rainbow, it also makes me think of that, that people that are on a spectrum, um, that we can all be who we are. And there's not anything that is inherently wrong with us for being who we are. Mm-hmm. That we mm-hmm. can just be who we are and that's okay. And we all have something unique and different to give just by being ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, that was really kind of the last topic that I had to, for us to talk about today, um, was exactly that. So I read another article probably sometime over the last year, and I feel like I've maybe touched on it on a previous episode, but I, I'm fascinated to hear what you guys think about it. Um, so if you happen to be a mild conspiracy theorist, which I feel like you aren't at least mildly, you're not paying attention. Um, but so we've definitely seen, especially from where we all grew up in the, you know, the late post 80s kind of, you know, everything was neon, everything was bright. And we've really kind of shifted into like when you talk about like color culture right now, as far as like decorating, clothing, kind of all these things, everything is really dull. Everything is really muted. Everything is fucking beige. Everything is white. Um, and that the, the mild conspiracy theorists say that that has to do with the, exactly what Rev is talking about, the suppression of the self that what are things that are childlike in our society? bright colors, um, acting silly, you know, kind of things that all kind of go into that. You're acting like a quote unquote child in that there are people who think that anybody who likes bright colored, like rainbow colored things, that even though you are an adult who's fully functioning, that there's still some immature quality about you. And so like that part of you is still trying to be, that's what the, you know, the lizards in the sky are trying to suppress Um, is the color aspect of it. And so I really agree with you, Becky, about how there has been this reclaiming of color in my life, because like, I, like I said, I like a lot of like iridescent, like holographic things. I have a lot of plants that grow in water. So I have a lot of like vases that are clear, but treated with the kind of, you know, different shimmery colors. And, um, I love how colors play together and talk to each other. The whole fish tank is just this like neon Willy Wonka playground. Um, and so I I can see the correlation by that, that by embracing color and it doesn't have to be your whole personality, but that the colors are who we are at any given moment on any given day. I really, good job, Becky. You nailed that. Like that's the note I had written down and you didn't even know that magic. Well, duh. (laughs) (laughs) I would say, you know, culturally that there has been a movement towards assimilation um, and it comes and goes in waves that, you know, with the colors being bright and vibrant and then, you know, aesthetically going to things that are more muted. And um, I I would argue that we are shifting away from that now. Um, if you you see what's popular now in mainstream, you know, culture and things like that, that there is that reclaiming of color and like the fashion, uh, fashion week and things like that. When you see the pictures of the clothes and stuff, they're wild. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know why somebody thought that was a good idea, but I'm glad that they're making <laughs> it. <and> they're it. <laughs> um. But, you know, you see that um, in people's lives and ebbs and flows. And um, my younger sister, who's trans, um, recently started wearing more feminine type colors. And so you'll see that like associating um, with your identity, um, the your use of color and that you have control over how you portray yourself to the outside world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty sad that <laughs> um, that there's this loss of color, but I think that that just, yeah, 
Um, I have a lot of thoughts, but at the end of the day, I just think that's very like white capitalistic because when you mm-hmm. step anywhere outside of that box, you will find color literally everywhere. Just mm-hmm. go to another state, go to another country, um, and you will find that color is everywhere. Um, and even mm-hmm. from these European countries, there's color. There's color. Right. Everywhere. Everywhere. Um, and so it's just so crazy. Just dumb lizards in the sky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, I feel like there was something to be said that there was this, uh, yes, it was a muting of the self, but then also how it was, um, mirrored in the war times as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there was a lot less color during those times. Um, and there was a lot more poverty and, you know, everything that goes with it. And I think that showing up in our society today also is very important. And yes, you should pay attention, open your eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but to reclaim color is also this like liberatory movement and act to say like, yeah, I, no matter what, I still can have joy. I still can represent myself and my community because of X, Y, and Z. Um, So yeah, it's, it is always good to when your life feels a little dull just just yeah. go outside for one or go play in with some other folks from different parts of the world mm-hmm. amen to that amen yeah. to that um i think we briefly touched on all the colors out there and we are coming up close on an hour final thoughts on color magic anything else that we left out want to add just do it. Utilize it. Do it. You know? Yeah. Don't live in a drab world. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Bring color, bring color to your spaces, whether that's, mm-hmm. you know, your home, um, mm-hmm. your workspace. I have worked in the cubicles with beige mm-hmm. walls <laughs> and I plastered them with pictures of butterflies and flowers mm-hmm. and animals and things that brought me joy um so don't let the world around you bring you down um you can bring that color to your own spaces you don't need it some outside force Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely you don't have to work in a place with bright colored walls to to be bright is all right Mm-hmm. Well, and bring be the be the color, be the color. I've mm-hmm. said for a long time that the part of why I gravitate so much to like the iridescent and the holographic things is because that is my aim is for my aura to be that color. I want to be <laughs> all of the colors. I just want to be this sparkling, dazzling radiance that can uplift anything. Yes, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. be that, be that. Well, all right, people. Color magic was fun. That was I like that. That was yeah. a good a good little chat that we had. I didn't know where we were going to go with that, but God, as always, I find it just so loving and endearing to be with you, lovely ladies. Likewise. Thank you, listeners, okay. for tuning in. And what do we always say at the end of every episode? <laughs> Stay, magical. Stay magical. Stay magical. Stay magical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Magical Aspirations. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Magical Aspirations to keep up with the latest and the greatest from Annalisa, Adriana, and Reverend Raven. And to join in on the Magical Aspirations conversations. Come check out our website, MagicalAspirations.com, to find bonuses from our guests, our Magical Aspirations blog, and to reach out to our magical hosts with questions, comments, reviews, or ideas for future episodes. We are so grateful for each and every one of you listening. Thank you again, and as always, stay true to your magic.